Hello everybody and welcome to this session organized by Standard Chartered Bank to provide an update on the transition of market rates from LIBOR to risk-free rate or RFRs as we call them. Can we go to the next slide? I'm your first speaker, Ravi Sheikh Sharma, and over the next hour, me and my colleagues will go through an agenda that provides an introduction of the key milestones of this journey away from LIBOR. Can we go to the next agenda? Next slide, next slide, please. As I was saying, we put through together an agenda that provides an introduction on the key milestones on this journey away from LIBOR, introduce term RFRs as well as other benchmarks that are available in the market, summarize our RFR capabilities and our bank's offerings, and then take a deep dive into the term RFR-based pricing construct with some work examples before we recap what the next steps are and talk through some of the reference material that we have available for your perusal. Next slide, please. With that, let's kick off with a brief introduction of this session. I'd like to start off with talking about some of the key milestones which are important in this transition from a timeline perspective. As you might be aware, for GBP, Euro, JPY, and CHR, LIBOR as a benchmark will cease to exist after 31st December 2020, which means for these currencies from 1st January of 2022, we will use risk-free rates to transact in financial market. For US dollar, the LIBOR benchmark will continue, but its usage for transactions is limited as the regulatory bodies have prescribed that new deals or new stock in US dollar labor should not increase from 1st January 2022, which means new deals from 1st Jan of 2022 will have to be transacted and priced using RFR. In that respect, towards the end of July and early August, there was guidelines provided on the usage of term RFR rates as well, which while providing a forward-looking term structure like LIBOR does today, continues to be RFR, i.e. risk-free rates, which means when we compare these risk-free rates to LIBOR, they do not have the credit and term liquidity premium built in, which means that term RFRs, though they give us a forward-looking structure, they will be priced and they will be trending lower than LIBOR as they do not have that embedded credit spreads like LIBOR does. Before we move on, I'd like to also inform you that we have a Q&A section available. So please feel free to type in your questions and we will look to answer as many of them, if not all, during the session. With this brief introduction, I'd like to now like pass this on to my colleague who will walk you through the next part of this presentation. David, over to you. Thanks, Abhishek. Uh, can we move the next slide, please? Hello to everyone and thank you for joining today. By way of introduction, I work as part of the group compliance work stream, focusing on LIBOR transition from a conduct perspective. So from the 31st of December, the end of this year, the IBA will cease the publication of most LIBOR settings, effectively bringing to an end the 36 year run since the benchmark's inception by the BBA in 1986 of what was at one time deemed the world's most important number. Publication of most LIBOR currencies and tenors will cease or be deemed non-representative after 31st of December this year, including one week and two month US dollar LIBOR. Publication of US dollar LIBOR will continue until the 30th of June, 2023, the overnight one month, three month, six month and 12 month tenors. In addition, from the 31st of December this year, Standard Chartered will cease entering into new US dollar LIBOR transactions other than for risk management purposes. As such, clients should switch to trading SOFA or, or an alternative reference rate as soon as practicable and no later than 31st of December. To date, the bank has prioritized the remediation of non-USD US dollar LIBOR exposures. And as US dollar LIBOR will continue to be published for most settings until mid-2023, we'll look to remediate these positions in due course. Finally, it's worth noting that Ionia will also be discontinued on the 3rd of January 2022. The risk-free rate alternative recommended by the Euro Risk-Free Rate Working Group for Ionia is the Euro Short-Term Rate, or ESTA, 
and clients can also continue to use Eurobor, for which there are currently no plans in place to cease. Move to the next slide, please. So one of the biggest concerns in light of LIBOR's forthcoming cessation has been the availability of forward-looking rates, for which regulatory and industry groups, particularly the FMSB for term Sonia in sterling markets, as well as the ARC, term SOFA, have recognized a need in specific areas of the market, including trade and working capital products that require a forward-looking rate for discounting. The development of robust term rates is dependent on underlying volumes in risk-free rate derivatives markets, and given that we're seeing some increasing liquidity here, I'm just going to provide some details around term rates currently in existence. As we can see from this slide, term risk-free rates are currently available for SOFA, SONIA, and the Tokyo term risk-free rate, or TORF. CME term SOFA was recently formally endorsed by the U.S. Alternative Reference Rates Committee, ARC, save for the recently published 12-month tenor, for which CME expects will be evaluated by the ARC for endorsement. Term software will obviously also play an important role as part of the ARC-recommended fallback waterfall and the current New York State legislation for tough legacy contracts. Moving to look at term SONIA, two different SONIA term rates are currently in publication by the IBA and Refinitiv respectively in one, three, six, and 12-month tenors. As mentioned, term software is also available in these tenors, though TORF is currently only available in the one, three, and six month tenors. The calculation methodology for Refinitiv and IBA term SONIA both use a waterfall based on SONIA OIS order book data, which differs slightly but produces a similar rate. For example, the IBA rate is based on data from three interdealer brokers during a 120 minute window, and the Refinitiv rate is based on data from two interdealer brokers during a 20 minute window. The Sterling Risk Free Rate Working Group have published a comparison of the two rates, which are able to provide if anyone as part of the call is interested in further details. Although the Sterling Risk Free Rate Working Group has not formally made a recommendation in respect of any particular term SONIA reference rate, the FCA did propose to include the rate published by the IBA as a component in synthetic Sterling LIBOR in its recent consultation. In respect of ESTA, Refinitiv and IBA have published details on methodologies for prospective ESTA term rates, and the bank is following any developments on this as they're released by the Euro Risk Free Rate Working Group. For Sauron, the lack of liquidity here means there's currently no intention to publish a term Sauron, as provided for by the National Working Group on Swiss Franc reference rates. Move on to the next slide, please. So we understand that some clients have asked about the development of credit sensitive rates in their discussions with frontline colleagues. First point to make here is that the bank supports the adoption of risk-free rates as the preferred alternative rates in line with much regulatory and industry guidance. As we can see from the quotes provided on the right-hand side of this slide, both UK and US regulators have struck notes of caution in respect of the use of credit sensitive rates, citing, among other things, concerns around their robustness in times of market stress. In terms of the existing credit sensitive rates, four main rates that have emerged are Ameribor, which is produced by AFE, Busby, produced by Bloomberg, the Bank Yield Index, produced by the ICE, and the Credit Inclusive Term Rate, which is published by IHS Market. As stated, we currently have no plans to offer credit sensitive rates, but will continue to track and monitor industry developments in this regard. I'll hand back to Abhishek here to take you through the current risk for rate capabilities within transaction banking. Thank you, David. That was helpful. Hi, everyone. Abhishek here again. Uh, as David mentioned, it's a good segue into this slide where we wanted to specifically talk about uh, the risk free rate capabilities for transaction banking. The bank does expect to have a full suite of RFR product capabilities for trade and cash to be ready by 1st November 2021. Even as we speak, the bank is gearing up and getting together the necessary platforms and architecture in place so that we are ready for a 1st November 2021 update to then be in a position to then offer RFR based pricing. In terms of term RFR for GBP, the bank will use term SONIA as the base benchmark rate. For JPY, it will be top. For US dollar, term SOFA. For Euro, transactions continue to be priced on Euribor as, as of now, as David mentioned this benchmark continues to exist. So from 1st November, we hopefully will be in a position 
to be able to deal and transact using these term rates for the current set currencies here. Can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. I think this is a slide which I'd like to spend a few minutes on before I pass it to my colleague Gotham to take you through this slide and then the presentation as we move further. I think I covered this briefly in my introduction. Uh, at the moment, from a pricing perspective, the construct is essentially LIBOR plus an X spread, which is added on top to work out the all-in pricing for trade loans today. As we move into an RFR-based pricing construct, as mentioned earlier, RFR, though like LIBOR, provides us a forward-looking term structure. For example, I have a three-month LIBOR, US dollar LIBOR today. I will have a three-month US dollar term TOFR available. But that term so far being a risk-free rate will not have the embedded credit liquidity premiums built into it like LIBOR. So as that small picture there shows, the LIBOR blue box is a lot larger than the new term RFR gray box because those embedded liquidity and credit premium are now part of the green box in the new term RFR construct to ensure from an all-in pricing perspective, we have consistency on how we price. This is something I'd like to spend a minute more on to just make sure we all are comfortable with this construct and I'd welcome, as I mentioned earlier, that we have Q&A section. So please feel free to add any questions that you think are on your mind that you'd like us to talk through. As the next few slides, we'll go into a lot more details with illustrative examples and numbers of what this construct looks like and how it works in different scenarios. Good time for me to introduce my other colleague, Gotham, to continue with this slide and then take this presentation forward. Over to you, Gautam. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. And uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to uh, all of you who have joined us. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, just to spend a little, uh, just a few seconds more on this uh, on particular uh, uh, slide that we have in front of you. Um, it is quite important to note that, uh, as Abhishek also mentioned, that the RFR rates are purely risk-free rates, and and the way the forward curves are, uh, are are determined in the market, it is to estimate the forward expectation of the overnight rate for uh, in the term RFR world, whereas LIBOR obviously has a lot more defined term structure based on a forward forward-looking curve. It does contain the that element of uh, credit and risk premium already embedded inside the LIBOR rate. That is not available inside the term RFR rates, uh, purely because of the fact that they are of a risk-free nature. And as a consequence of that, and also to maintain this uh, economic equivalence between the two methods, as specifically as we transition away from LIBOR and into the RFR world, the margins would now continue to include the credit and term risk premium. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, please, as we'll walk you through some of the illustrative examples that we have prepared. Thank you. So over here, what we have up in your in your screens is an example of a credit bills negotiated, which is with the variant of which is a UPAS LC, and we have done a six month case study on uh, on this, where the tenor of the transaction is for six months, and we have compared that in the LIBOR world versus the term RFR world. So in in the LIBOR world, you're quite familiar with the pricing construct. It com it contains two components. One is the benchmark as such, and the other one is the margin. The sum total of those two becomes the all-in price that is uh, quoted for that particular transaction. Given that this is a six-month transaction, you're looking at a six-month LIBOR rate, which stands at 16 basis points. Again, these are just illustrative numbers, and we have a margin over here quoted at 50 basis points. The sum total of both brings you to the all-in price quoted at 66 basis points for that particular transaction. What's important to note is when this rate gets quoted, obviously they are locked in for that entire period of that particular transaction and they do not change. As we transition away from LIBOR into the uh, IBOR, uh, into the post uh, IBOR world or in, rather into the RFR world, if the same transaction were to be priced sometime in uh, after 1st Jan 2022, it's important to note that the pricing construct as such, that the components over there do not change. The, the formula as such still remains the same. It is still those two components. You have a benchmark, and you have uh, a margin that is quoted. Again, the sum total of those two will give you the all-in price. 
Now, instead of using LIBOR, we have the six month term SOFA rate over here, which is as it's quoted inside the market by, by CME in, in this particular instance, because we are talking of uh, term SOFA and we have the total margin that is quoted around over there. And the summation of both of them give you the all in price. If you try to do a price comparison between the two, um, two methods of the two pricing constructs, you would notice that the prices are fairly similar. Now, the RFR rates, we all do know that these are risk-free rates, and we have been reiterating this fact that they do not contain any term or liquidity premium in them. The rates as such are just closest to market based on transactions and, and you know, a fairly robust methodology that CME has come up with, and they are, they are the pure market expectation of the overnight rate in six months' time. Now, in order to try and have them in an economic equivalent manner between LIBOR and, and the RFR world, the credit and liquidity premium, which is actually missing from the terms of a rate is a part of the margin. And the summation of all, all of that is the, the actual price that you would see over here. So the next slides, we'll take you through a few more examples. Uh, if you could move us to the next slide, please. Thank you. Over here, we are looking at a financial institution trade loan uh, example. Um, again, for uh, comparative purposes, we have just kept the the rate of, or rather the tenor of the transaction at, at six months itself. Um, and we're comparing how the pricing is done today and how the pricing would be done in the post eyeball world. So the formula again over here is something which, you're, which you should be fairly uh, familiar with. It has those two components. It has a LIBOR rate and it has a margin. Some total of those two gives you the all-in price over there. The reference rate, of course, for that it being a six-month asset, it's going to be priced on the six-month uh, LIBOR rate that is being quoted out in the market. As we transition away from there and into the RFR world, if the same asset was priced was to be priced in 2022, the pricing formula as such, again, does not undergo any change. It is still those two components. You have the six-month term SOFA rate and you have a margin quoted around over there. The margin, as, as mentioned inside the previous slides, would contain the term and credit premium. Uh, embedded in them. In this particular example, you would notice that the all-in prices between the, the existing uh, LIBOR method and the, uh, the post-LIBOR method turns out to be the same. This is purely because of the fact that the rates are all market determined around over here. And the net result in this particular case is that the rates are, th are the same in, uh, in, the pre in the current IBOR world as well as in the post-IBOR world. Now, how do we also try and price transactions which come up for odd tenors? So we have an example for if we were to price a four month uh, FI trade loan to be priced. Now, the CME only publishes limited tenors. Uh, and in fact, that is actually a common trend for all our term RFR rates. The typical tenors that are being priced are, of course, other than the overnight rate, which is the, the, the pure baseline. You have the one month, three month, six month. and Fairly soon, we would have the endorse, hope to have the endorsement for the 12 month rate, particularly for term so far. Any other tenors that are there in between are typically, typically going to be linearly interpolated between the two published tenors. So, in an example like this, if we were to price a four month asset, the four month term so far rate would be linearly interpolated between the two closest tenors, which would be the three month and the six month uh, published tenors. We also have a scenario where if you would like to price a transaction which exceeds one year, what happens in that case? Now, as mentioned, the market curve for all these term RFRs as things stand are either at the six month point or maximum extend out to the one year point. Beyond that, the rates are typically determined by the market IRS curve, and it's also a function of other internal bank methodologies. If you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So up until now, we have been talking about transactions which are fixed rate in nature, in the sense that we have, uh, at the point of booking that particular transaction, we have agreed on a rate and that remains locked in and constant through the contractual period of that particular, uh, particular transaction. We've taken examples of six months, so we'll continue to stay at that six month example itself. But in this particular uh, case study, we're gonna be looking at a FI trade loan with a periodic reset. So in a, sense, in a sense, this is a floating rate transaction. Now, the pricing formula as such again, does not undergo any change. 
The only difference over here is instead of having a six month rate as my reference benchmark, we're going to be having a one month rate that would reset itself every month going forward or the entire period of the particular transaction. So if you look at the table on the right hand side over there, you have the one month fixing rates that are being made available for, uh, for the period of that particular transaction and you have the margin. Now it's also important to note over here that the margin remains unchanged throughout the contractual period of that particular transaction. So it remains at 78 basis points across the entire transaction. And the only variable component that we have over here is the resetting of the one month term rate, which is again entirely a market dependent uh, uh, factor. The all in price as a consequence of, of, of the change in, in the one month term rate also undergoes certain change because it's just a simple addition, uh, addition formula around over here to get the all in price for these uh, for this transaction. I will now take this opportunity to pass it to my colleague Ishita to take you through some of the frequently asked questions and a few additional points that would be important for this transition. Thank you and to you Ishita. I got them. Thank you so much. Um, we'll cover a couple of our FAQs or frequently asked questions. We've covered them in the slides previously, but it will be a good recap for all of us. Uh, the first question I'm sure most of you have on your mind that will the all in rate change when we start using terms so far? Yes, but the all in rate, but the RFR and all in rate is expected to remain at similar levels to the LIBOR plus margin, uh, margin pricing construct. And as we have seen in the previous examples, our all in rate didn't change alarmingly, even though there was a change in the margin. Will term software be market discoverable? Yes, term software is market discoverable and it will be published on the CME website. Another question that we've received from a couple of our clients is that if they have issued a US dollar LIBOR UPAS LC, which is a user payable at site LC prior to 31st of December 2021 with the maturity in 2022, can we fix the pricing on LIBOR? So yes, we can fix the pricing based on LIBOR because the transaction will be booked prior to the cutoff date, which is 31st of December 2021, though the payment of, of the interest plus the uh, principal will only be received in 2022. So what we're trying to explain here is that as long as the transaction has been booked prior to the cutoff date, which is 31st of December 2021, we do not need to take any further action. Can we book floating transactions using term software? For most of us, for a couple of our clients, actually, we do book floating FITLs, and that's the example that Gotham just walked us through. And therefore, yes, using term software too, we can continue booking floating transactions. To avail of an FITL today, uh, the FI has to send us, our FI clients send us an MT799 format where they request us for the FITL with other details in it. So this MT799 will undergo a slight change because now LIBOR will be replaced with terms offer for US dollar and you all will be receiving that shortly. Um, when come, we come back to floating transactions or reset of FITLs, in Q4 2021, can, will SCB still book uh, FITLs in currencies of GBP, JPY and CHF for reset transactions? So no, because this GBP, JPY, CHF will cease to exist from the 1st of January 2022, we will not be able to offer you any reset transactions under these currencies from Q4 2021. Therefore, we will be pricing it based on the corresponding RFR for that particular currency. Similarly, if you want to book an FITL in Q4 for a US dollar transaction, is that still possible? So yes, we can still continue to book a US dollar transaction till 31st of December 2021, even with the reset opportunity, even if the reset is in 2022, because US dollar LIBOR will exist in 2022. But we as a bank will recommend that to our clients that we will we should move to RFR in Q4 2021 itself. May we please go to the next slide? So a couple of our take, uh, key takeaways or next steps that we would like you to uh, remember after and you know go through when you once this uh, presentation is over. So from 31st of December 2021, no new US dollar LIBOR transactions can be booked. 
uh, we will be switching to term RFR as explained and as you have seen the different examples our all in will remain practically the same. As a bank, we have a full suite of RFR capabilities, be it for one month, two months, and like we shared, how can we, how will we price transactions which are even for four months and five months? Uh, the RFR rate is expected to be lower than a term RFR is expected to be lower than LIBOR because it doesn't have any credit premium and liquidity premium. But for economic equivalence, the, there will be a there will be some portion which will be added into the margin, and therefore the all in all will pretty much remain the same. Uh, can we please go to our next question or slide? So what should you be expecting from us after this presentation? We will be engaging with you if you have any outstanding JPY, GBP or CHF LIBOR transactions booked with us with a reset opportunity in 2022. If there is no reset transaction for 2022, then there is no remediation needed for such transactions. Therefore, for these currencies, only if those transactions with a reset in 2022 will you hear from us. You will be hearing from your sales team very shortly with the amended MT799 format. This will have the LIBOR being replaced with terms offer and will be used from 1st of January 2022. We hope that this gives you enough time to review it, go through it with your legal teams. And if you do have any concerns, please do reach out to your salesperson. Similarly, for any new UPAS transaction or Usance payable at site transaction, which will be booked with SCB from Ostanchart Bank from 1st of January 2022, we will start pricing them on term RFR and not on US dollar LIBOR anymore. As we had shared, since US dollar LIBOR is existing till 31st of December 2021 for unadvised transactions, we can continue to book transactions under this and any deal which has been booked on US dollar LIBOR till this cutoff date does not need any remediation uh, and therefore that transaction will continue as it is. So we hope this helps clarify your key takeaways and you will keep hearing from us regarding the MT799 format. I'll hand it back to my colleague Abhi. Thank you, Ashita. Hi, everyone. Abhishek here again. Could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, this is an important uh, page that I wanted to just spend a quick few seconds on. This essentially lists down all the different material that we've tried to put together to hopefully help you get as much information as possible in addition to this web session that we are currently having with you. So please feel free to have a look. Please take note of the email address provided if you have specific questions. You, of course, have your individual RMs who will be well equipped to answer any queries that you have, whether on pricing or remediation. So I, I, I would definitely encourage and recommend that please do set some time and have conversations with your respective RM so they can walk you through the capabilities. They can explain the pricing construct for your specific deals that you have and can go through and help you answer any other questions that you have as part of the overall remediation. We will be making sure that you get uh, a copy of, of, of this information with yourself so that you can take a read at your own at your own leisure and feel free to come back to us at any point of time with any questions that you have. Uh, uh, speaking of questions, we have seen quite a few come in. Uh, we've tried to answer most of them, but it, some of them I think are really useful for us to, to get into some more detail. Uh, there are a question of, couple of questions which are linked to tough legacy. David, would you mind just providing a little more detail for our larger audience on the response that you gave and then I can chip in as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Abhishek. So as a, as kind of response, to the questions around uh, what are the conditions to define an agreement as tough legacy. So the tough legacy contracts are generally considered to be those that you know genuinely have no or an inappropriate fallback rate alternatives um, and you know and on I suppose the, the other side to that is the, the, where there's no realistic ability for them to be renegotiated um, or amended. Now it, it's, it's kind of worth noting obviously that tough legacy uh, is being dealt with uh, sort of uh, cross-jurisdictionally, I suppose. Um, so, you know, 
basically reach out to my 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 kind of advice on this is to reach out to your to your RMs and your you know wherever they're based because you know basically different jurisdictions are taking different approaches to tough legacy um and it's it, it's important to kind of be aware of the, of the various permutations uh, as as they develop thanks uh, thanks david very helpful uh, i hope that answered the question again feel free to type in if you'd uh, like uh, if you need further clarifications here and we'd be more than happy to provide of course I would just add that there was also a follow-up with regards to 12-month LIBOR. And as David covered in the earlier slides, we do have 12-month alternatives available to prices on. So we will look to, from a trade finance perspective, use the 12-month uh, rate points as wherever practicably possible to price you. Again, I would recommend for your specific deals where you have underlying positions or new positions likely to come up, please do reach out to your RMs and they'll be more than happy to support you and they have the necessary information to walk you through what the new pricing construct is going to look like. Uh, just looking at some of the other questions which have come through, Ishita, would, I, would you mind if I direct this to you? Can UPAS be done in advance? Every, thank you for that. Actually, I was just answering uh, on, I was typing it. But yes, so basically, UPAS does not undergo any, uh, you know, product change or any underlying structure change. You, for a UPAS transaction, the FI client pays their principal at maturity along with the interest. And that will continue to be just the same. The only difference is that instead of the interest being uh, calculated on a LIBOR benchmark, it will now be calculated on a term RFR benchmark, assuming that it's a US dollar LIBOR transaction. So the construct of the product, the construct of the variant is just as it is. It's the only difference is the benchmark pricing. I hope that helps the question. And anybody, if any is any any follow up, please do you know put it in the question and answer session, and we'll try our level best to answer it right now. Thank you, thank you, Ishita. I'll take on a few more. I can see a few more coming in, which is excellent. I, I really appreciate all the questions because they, it just helps to carry on the engagement and helps us think through things if we haven't we haven't been very clear on them. So thank you. Please do keep the questions coming in. We'll try to cover as much as possible over the next 20 odd minutes. But the next one I wanted to talk about because I think it's an important one is when will the new FI TLMT79 formats be sent? Uh, we are working through, we are in matter of fact, in the final stages of finalizing the new MT799 formats that have the appropriate language to support RFR pricing. Our hope is by early next week, we will start to circulate those new formats. Again, the individual RMs will be your key point of contact uh, to provide you those formats. So please do reach out to them. They will on their own as well, of course, start to engage with you at some time from next week. With the new formats to get you as to get you very very comfortable as soon as possible on the language that we'll be using. Uh, next question, Gotham, uh, I think is an important one. You you'd probably be great at this, so I'll pass it to you. Which there's a question which asks about: Will there be an option to use overnight compounded rates with interest period taken in advance for the clients apart from the term RFR rates as well, Gotham? Um, the short answer for this would be uh, we wouldn't need an overnight compounded rate over here because if you really look at the term RFR rates, they are forward looking in, in nature and that takes away the requirement to have a rate which is reset on a daily, ba on a daily basis, whether it's compounded or simple interest. It, it really doesn't have any material difference uh, when it comes to really short periods of uh, you know, interest calculations. The advantage with the term rates that we have is that you have full knowledge of your borrowing costs upfront. So this also, you know, kind of provides you with uh, with how you would want to, uh, uh, rather better management chances to how you would want to uh, better manage your cash flows around over here. Now, do we offer overnight rates? Definitely, we will. Uh, we do offer overnight rates. They would be in as an overnight simple interest as opposed to the overnight compound interest period. And they would also definitely be offered in advance as opposed to compounded in arrears. Um, thank you to you, Abhi. Hey, Gautam, thanks for that, helpful. The next question, which I think Gautam's answered, but I think it's worth uh, 
worth me just talking through that is because it's a, it's a slightly different question which asked about what rates will be used for sing dollar given the lack of term rate so we are aware for sing dollar there is a lack of term rates and we are monitoring uh, with, with with the respective regulator around what the development looks like in that space having said that please feel free to reach out to your rms and we will make sure for the your specific uh, deals that you have based on the tenor that you need the pricing for we will provide alternative pricing uh, to ensure that, that we can continue to deal with us as, as smooth a manner as possible so please do reach out to your rms and we will be happy to get into as much detail on pricing that that you need to for your specific transaction while we wait for new questions to come in there's another one which i think is a good one that gotham's answered and gotham could i request you to just walk through for the for the larger audience interests uh, can we provide some more details on trade financing for mncs sure thank you uh, abhishek uh, so the pricing construct that we have taken you through in in some of the previous slides over here is is essentially just with two components libor and a benchmark uh, and the uh, the benchmark and of course the uh, the margin now that pricing construct although in in uh, in the in this particular presentation we have used it for you know very specific um, you know fi or unadvised products doesn't really change as we transition away from uh, from libor for all of trade finance products so if you have whether it's a discounted product that uh, in the uh, on the corporate side or even if it's a product which is uh, as an example if it's an import invoice financing uh, sort of a transaction where the interest settlement is is rear ended these rates or this pricing construct that we have which is the term rfrs plus a margin is applicable equally to to that particular segment as well so that's one of the uh, uh, advantages that we have with uh, with the term rates that are uh, uh, that have come about over here the fact that they are forward looking they can be applied for any particular transaction uh, within the within the trade finance world which actually requires a forward looking um, uh, rate for uh, for pricing i hope that uh, answers the uh, question uh, back to you abhishek thank you kotu uh, one other question which came in uh, ask about what happens to trade facilities uh, uh, if they are unadvised unadvised and how would be notified about changes for their pricing so in all cases pricing will be based on rfr from 1st january 2022 because for unadvised facilities they will be they will have to in, in part of the regulatory prescription move to new dollar positions which means any transaction post 1st january 2022 will be priced on on the alternative rfr rates so i would request you to please reach out to your respective rm and ask about what the pricing would look like depending upon the tenor that you're looking for and what pricing deal that you have underlying so please do reach out to your rm then they will be able to give you specific answers on your pricing uh, request but from 1st january 2022 standard chartered will move for all the unadvised facilities to price using rfr rates so there's another question which came in uh, from ashad which asked about where can they get more information about sofer i.e. how is it derived i think the cme website would be a good starting point ashad to look through and read about the construct Uh, Gautam, uh, David, anything you can add in terms of where can Ashad get more information about SOFA and its derivation and calculation? Yeah, so if we're just talking about, um, yeah, I actually just posted the uh, uh, the link um, to the C- yeah, uh, the CME yeah. terms of a methodology. Yeah, thanks, and uh, yeah, I presume the question is about terms of a, um, but yeah, just to just to make you aware that the uh, New York Fed has a number of kind of resources and um, information packs on its website about uh, just standard software as well. Thank you both. That was helpful. Uh, there's one more question which is coming right now uh, uh, david uh, uh, let me see if you can help us answer part of it and then we can get into more details where well, there's question on the assurance on sofa sonia rate uh, around how the rates will actually get so i think this is linked i would recommend to whoever has asked this question because the answer is not available to 
to refer to the same material that that Gotham's replied on the previous question with the link to CME. Gotham, could you also provide the link on this answer as well, so that uh, I think the information and clarity around how SOFR gets calculated and how it remains consistent uh, uh, in terms of uh, the underlying contracts that are used, and it's not really uh, uh, a judgment call and how the actual calculation works will probably help to allay some of the fears uh, or, or the, the concerns which have come through this question. So it'll be good to have that information shared. I think Gotham's just done that, which is helpful. Again, if you have any follow-ups, feel, feel free to reach out to use. You can use this forum where we have some more time to ask any other questions. We have the email address and the other resources, which obviously will be shared with you. And of course, your first port of call can, can be your individual RMs will be more than happy to provide any information that you need on pricing for your respective teams. So please feel free to reach out to them to get all information that you, that you require. Looking at if there are any other follow-up questions at the moment, I don't see any new questions which have come up. Uh, I, while, while we wait for any other questions to come up, it'll be good to just quickly summarize the key points that we've covered today around term RFR capabilities and stand charts endeavor to have term RFR for all our trade finance transactions from 1st November. Uh, the new pricing construct that we spoke about, which moves from LIBOR plus a spread to a term RFR plus spread, the spread having now needed to be recalibrated to ensure the credit and term liquidity premiums which were part of the LIBOR now are, have to be carried forward in the spread, ensuring at an overall total pricing level we have consistency on how we are pricing. Another important point that we covered which is very useful will be the MT799 which is how we will transact with you and the new format will be made available via the RMs uh, hopefully by next week. So you can start to get a feel of them and you're very comfortable with how we'll transact with you using these MT799s from the beginning of 2022. I'll give it another minute to see if any other questions come through. I don't see any other questions which have come through uh, recently at the moment. Uh, there have been a couple of questions on the copy of this presentation and my other colleague, uh, Jolene, has shared the information that presentation will be emailed and today's recorded session will also be provided. So please do look out from an email from us next week, which should provide you with a copy of this, which allows you to then at your own leisure, take more time to read through this, look at the additional reference material. And of course, feel free to reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions and we'll be more than happy to, to provide you with any answer. We have a common mailbox on all eyeball related queries, which is on display here. Additional on specific questions on tra transaction tra trade pricing for your individual transactions, you'll of course have the RMs available to talk you to everything that you need. There's another question which is coming up. Given the reasons for LIBOR being retired, what's the difference? I guess the question is how are RFRs different from LIBOR and what makes them better? David, any insights you'd like to provide? Yeah, so that there are kind of a couple of reasons, uh, I suppose, provided by uh, various regulators and supervisors worldwide, uh, you know, various uh, concerns with LIBOR. I, I suppose the kind of key, the key point about risk-free rates uh, that they're, you know, that's, that's kind of propelled or, you know, the, the reason for the, for the support for risk-free rates is that they're supposed to be, you know, based on huge underlying liquid markets. Um, and also, I, I, one thing that's definitely been touted as kind of a, an advantage, I suppose, over LIBOR and um, similar rates is the uh, behavior of these rates uh, within times of market stress. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I suppose those are kind of two of the key points um, that, the, that have been touted as, as, as advantages of, of risk-free rates. Thank you, David. Hopefully, Arshad, that helps. Uh, please do feel free to add any follow-up questions that you have here. We've got another one which is coming from Roberta. Uh, Roberta, on the specifics of the pricing difference between LIBOR and SOFR and how the spreads need to be readjusted, I, most banks, I obviously can't speak for any particular bank on how they will manage it, but the fact that the rate 
rate differential exists between LIBOR and RFR is obviously uh, is known to everyone. And each bank will look at its own individual pricing construct to determine the most appropriate to price uh, price their respective clients. Again, uh, on your if there are specific deals that that you have or that need to be transacted with clients, of course, feel free to route your queries to your RMs who will be able to walk you through the details of what the pricing construct will look like depending upon the economics of the trade that you're wanting to execute. Gautam, anything you'd like to add on the 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 term RFR versus LIBOR and the adjustment in margin? Um, uh, nothing much, Abhishek. You've actually summed it up. But I would just like to, uh, uh, because Roberta has come up with a, a follow-up question saying, touching question, all competitor banks will work the same way, same benchmark. Uh, Roberta, definitely the benchmarks are all, uh, I would say, at this moment, crystallized. Uh, you have... For each particular currency, like for, for sterling LIBOR, you have the terms on your reference rate, which is uh, which is a recommended benchmark. For a Japanese yen, you have the TORF rate, and for US dollar, you have the uh, CME terms of a rate. So there is a one one is to one relationship between the currency, its its current uh, existing LIBOR benchmark, and the equivalent term RFR benchmark. Of course, there are uh, additional benchmarks that are coming about, which are credit sensitive in nature, but there is still a, a little bit or a lack of consensus for uh, for those in in terms of um, you know continued usage of them it's not at this moment recommended or endorsed by the regulators so in in terms of options that are out over there other than of course the other traditional uh, options of uh, of pricing like uh, you know whether it's an all in fixed rate or cost of funds rate the available risk free rate that we have they are very finite at this moment and it is the CME terms of rate for US dollars, the uh, TOR rate for Japanese yen, and the terms on your reference rate for uh, uh, for sterling. And for euros, we already know that Euribor continues, so there is, isn't any fundamental change um, in the way things are getting priced. So hopefully that, uh, that also answers your question. Thanks, Gautam, and thank you, Roberta, for that question. Hopefully that information was helpful for uh, our entire audience on this call. I'll give it another minute in case there are any other questions which come up. I was just scrolling through the other questions, and I think we have covered everything that's been asked so far in terms of pricing around MD7 and mines, around uh, the spread differentials, around tough legacy, around so for details and the information we've shared as reference material that can be read and understood. Again, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, apologies. Uh, do take a read of this presentation once it's shared with you next week. Have a have a further detailed read uh, on the pricing construct, on the resources that we have provided, additional industry material, and any follow-up questions via your RMs or through this common email box that we have here, please do, do continue to raise those with us as uh, it will help us ensure our, our, our help us firm up our remediation plans, will help us ensure that we continue to engage with you in the most constructive manner to ensure our transactions and dealings continue possible manner as we move into an RFR world. Uh, if there are no other questions from now, I think we can look to close this session. Uh, I'd just like to close by saying thank you very much for taking the time out. I know everyone has a busy, busy day ahead, depending upon where you are in the world. So I do appreciate you taking the time out. I'd like to also thank my colleagues for being here and hopefully put into a position to answer all the questions that you had. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if there's anything else that you require from us, or this we can help you with anything else. Any feedback that you have on this session, if there are more details that we can provide, if we can answer your questions in a better manner, please do provide that information to us and we'd be more than happy to address this moving forward. Please continue to engage your respective RMs who will be very well placed to provide you with all the information you need around pricing, around remediation. Until we speak again, on behalf of Standard Chartered Bank, thank you very much for attending today's session, and I hope you have a wonderful day and week ahead. Thank you.